Right. That's a whole nother hour for sure. <laughs> we'll need some hot tea. Yeah, hot tea in an hour for that one. <laughs> Welcome to Pros and Coms. In this podcast, I talk to people about their personal and professional stories, uncovering the different ways and common themes of resonating with an audience. After all, communication is essentially storytelling. I'm Maria Ginai, and today I'll be talking to Lakeisha Miller Barkley. Lakeisha is the CEO of the rubber division of the American Chemical Society. She took a somewhat scenic route through computer programming and finance before arriving at the helm of the rubber division. Lakeisha's been able to use her secret power of thriving in chaos during her first year as CEO during the pandemic. And she's passionate about education, inclusivity, and raising awareness of the rubber industry to the next generation. Lakeisha, your career has been quite... uh, Higgledy piggledy, I think that's a British term. I like it. I like it. Um, (laughs) But it's not been the most direct route to where you are now. So, do you want to tell me a bit about yourself and then how you've got to the point where you are? Absolutely. So, I definitely did not take the traditional path that I know uh, many of our members and people in the industry do. I did. I'm not a chemist by trade or an engineer. I'm actually an accountant by trade, and my previous background was uh, computer programming and networking. So. Um, definitely not the the straight route. Um, I spent some time in the Air Force right after I got out of high school, and I was very intrigued by um, everything to do with computers and programming. So when I got out, I went back to University of Akron, and I got a um, certification in programming and networking, and then went back and got my degree in accounting. I was actually not interested in science during that time of my life. Um, but my accounting background is what kind of drew me into this rubber industry. Um, I was hired to train the director, prior director of finance, and I had never heard of the rubber division. I'd never heard of American Chemical Society. I did not know anything about either one, but uh, was very taken aback by just the amount of, um, of products in our world that rubber touches, and I was just... I was completely amazed. I was one of those people who had no idea that it's in 40,000 things. Uh, I think from general population, they think tires. They maybe think the soles of their shoes, but they don't think anything else. And so um, I, I tell people I stumbled into the rubber industry like so many other people. So what was uh, what was it like being in Air Force? What did you do there? So I worked on A-10 jets, which are bombers. And so their, their sole priority is to drop bombs. <laughs> and uh, it's a little one-seater jet. And my role was to, um, to to do diagnostics on other computer parts. As you know, everything has computer, you know, computer parts and programming and things into it. So my job was to go out before the pilots um, took off and, and run diagnostics to make sure that everything was completely tip-top shaped so they have no issues while they were flying. And then also to debrief them, they get back to find out if there's any issues and then go fix those issues. So pulling a lot of computer parts, climbing up into a little bitty, uh, it was just a pole that slid down and it had like the alternating steps on it. And you kind of go again in and it just dropped down into this little this little bitty thing that was very, very, very powerful. And it was very exciting time for me. I absolutely loved it. That sounds really exciting. Maybe not great if you're claustrophobic. <laughs> exactly. It's definitely not really a claustrophobic. Yeah, that's not your place if you're claustrophobic at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're at uh, the American Chemical Society. Oh, can't speak. American Chemical Society Rubber Division. Yes. So what does that do? So we are one of the 32 technical divisions of American Chemical Society. Um, our, our founding fathers, I'll call them, were um, obviously in the rubber industry, and they wanted to make sure that knowledge was spread and, um, you know, that they were very much into education. Um, so we are, I'll, I'll read you our, our technical mission statement. Uh, it's the premier resource for the Lassimer industry by providing valuable opportunities to learn, connect, and grow. Um, we were founded over 100 years ago, and we are made up of chemists, engineers, technicians, scientists, plant en- plant managers, sales and marketing professionals, and pretty much anyone in the rubber or polymer fields. 
Um, we have a lot of academia and we have some government as well. So our primary concern and, and reason for living and being is to make sure that the rubber industry stays educated with technology um, and we share that information across everyone in the industry. And you said when you entered that area that you were surprised about how many things rubber is in. Do you want to give us like a rundown or what's the most surprising thing that people might not think has an association to rubber um, but actually does? I think your clothes. Um, I think people don't realize that your clothing has rubber in it and that uh, medical devices, a lot of things that are, are placed inside our body have, uh, you know, some form of rubber or silicones. And I think that people automatically, again, assume just the soles of their shoes and they think of rubber as I did something thick and heavy and, you know, durable, but it has so many other applications. And so just to learn that as I sat in different meetings, I got to meet different people that kind of gave me little glimpses of what they did. It was just mind boggling to know that this entire industry has existed um, for hundreds of years and, you know, so impactful to our world. And I guess back to basics, the basic question is, what is rubber? <laughs> How do you define <laughs> rubber? Because I've worked with silicone a lot. But then when you said, oh, medical device silicone, I was like, oh, yeah, silicone is rubber. <laughs> so rubber actually comes in two forms, uh, natural and synthetic. Natural rubber comes from over 400 different types of plants, but mostly from tapping rubber trees, which are primarily located in, on plantations in Southeast Asia. A fun fact, <laughs> there's currently a lot of research right now um, that's being done in, on the rubber sap that comes from dandelions. And so that's you know another market that may open up and uh, diversify the natural rubber industry. Uh, but natural rubber makes up about 40% of the market. And the second type is synthetic. It's actually a byproduct when refining petroleum into gasoline. And both types, um, I mean, they're used throughout the industry and they each have their, their pros and cons. Um, but, you know, recently to showcase all the thousands of things rubber are, are used in, we created a video, um, which you can view at notjusttires.org. And, you know, our campaign, our mission was to showcase all the applications and all the different opportunities in the rubber industry. And believe it or not, rubber has been used in some way dating all the way back to the 1400s, and it continues to be mysterious and evolving to this day. They're still finding different ways to use it and, and make it better. So you said you stumbled into the rubber division. What did that look like? How did you find out about it first of all? And then how have you progressed through to, to CEO where you are now? So um, again, my, my background is in accounting. So I was reached out to because the prior director of finance needed to be trained in a particular part of accounting. And so when I came in back in 2007, it was just a temporary thing for a couple months just to kind of help that person get um, you know, brought up to speed on, on something. Uh, again, I'd never heard of the division. I was a contractor. And uh, they eventually let that person go. And uh, the prior CEO at that time, he, he talked to the staff and said, hey, we, we need to get somebody in here temporary. And they're like, hey, where's that lady that was here? You know, she was really knowledgeable. And I guess I made a good impression. So, um, you know, he called me and said, hey, are you, you willing to come in for a little bit? And I said, sure. I was I actually st um, own and operated my own accounting business at the time. And I had no desire to ever go back to work for someone else full time. So this is how they say, you know, tell the gods, you know, what you want to do and watch them laugh because that was, I thought I was never going to go back to work for someone else. But the one thing I say that when I came in, I absolutely loved the team that was here, that's still here. Um, it was very family oriented. It was um, very genuine. And I said to myself, well, I'll just stay here long enough to get all their books cleaned up and then I'll move on. But it's been almost 14 years, you know, and I'm still here. So I started director of finance. Um, Mr. Miller, the prior CEO, hired me on permanently after like two months. Said, hey, you're what we're looking for. You know, do you want to stay? And then I slowly kind of uh, picked up more responsibilities, um, HR, uh, obviously technology, since that was my other background. And it just kind of naturally grew into um you know, more, more, uh, rec more responsibilities. And then when Ed announced that he was going to retire um, a few years back, you know, the board did their due diligence. They, they searched outside, inside, and I was selected in August of 2019. 
And so I knew in August that I would be the new CEO effective in January. And then obviously COVID decided that all of my plans that I'd had for my first hundred days or, you know, one year was going to be just upinged. So. <laughs> so the next question I have for you actually probably doesn't apply because we've been through a global pandemic. So I guess you don't have a, a typical day, but what sort of things would you do? Yeah, so in, in today's world, my typical day is obviously nonstop virtual meetings. Um, I am very adamant about growing our outreach department. Um, again, our existence is to educate the, the industry. And I'm also very passionate about making sure that the next generation um, and that women and that minorities are included in that next wave of workers um, in this industry. So I'm constantly on on calls and uh, virtual calls with key people in the areas that um, I think we can develop relationships and partnerships with. Um, I'm currently talking to the Greater Akron Chamber right now. They're doing some things. I'm working with some student organizations from uh, lots of different colleges, which is really exciting. So I love talking to the next generation. And and my, my goal is just to make sure that they are aware of the rubber industry. A lot of times they've never heard of us. Um, there are specific companies that go into colleges over and over, and that's all that the kids are exposed to. Uh, the rest of my day is probably like everybody else, email, 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 trying to get through emails, and, you know, <laughs> flag, and follow up and um, dealing with my wonderful staff and, you know, making sure that they have what they need to get their jobs done and run their departments and always preparing for the next meeting. So we're, we have two meetings coming up and just preparing for those. <laughs> A packed schedule then, full of Zoom, full of Zoom calls. Yes. <laughs> Zoom, right. What did we do before Zoom? <laughs> it's hard to think isn't we it we had you, mileage you... that's what we did we had <laughs> yeah so what have you learned from leading the rubber division through the pandemic through 2020 what sort of things have you learned about yourself personally and about leadership I think um, for myself personally, I learned that uh, I'm okay in chaos. It's one of my, I tell people my secret powers. So I know some people, when things kind of get chaotic, they kind of shrink and go, oh no, what now? And for me, it kind of like, it's like a energy for me. I, I want to make sure that I, that I stay on top of everything that's going on. I'm kind of like that that surfer, I think, that waits for those waves. They know they're coming and you just got to figure out how to ride it, you know? Um, so I learned that I am very capable of um, being okay in chaos. And I think as far as leadership, just that you, you have to be able to pivot quickly. I know that's the word that like we're all <laughs> hate to say in five more years. It's just like, I, if I have to say pivot one more time, right? But it's true. You have to be okay with, with um, taking information today and making a decision and then finding out tomorrow that that information is no longer valid and making another decision. And I think for leaders that don't like that, this was probably a very, very difficult time. Because if you are the kind of person that wants solid information, you know, you want to stick to that and don't make change, 2020 was probably very hard for you. Mm. Um, but I'm not that way. I want to I want to go with the most recent valid information. If that means between 12 and 4, we had to change directions. I'm okay with that. So what else do you think is important to have as an effective leader then? A um, couple different things. Uh, the ability to listen effectively, not necessarily to change your mind, but to try to pick up key points that could help you either adjust what you think or make an understanding, a better understanding of why the other person thinks the other way. Uh, I think we've gotten into a society where we kind of dig our heels in and it's like what I, what I believe is what I believe and what I know is what I know. But sometimes even if that person's intent is not to change your mind, it might just be able to give you a little bit more validity of why they think that way. Um, so being a leader, I think you have to learn to listen to that and uh, be okay with people not agreeing with you. I think that a lot of times people get into high positions and they feel like when they walk in the room, everyone should just agree with me, I'm here. And that's not true. They may follow your leadership because they're required to, but that doesn't you know, mean that they've bought into your your um, your thinking or your ideas. So it's important as a leader to be able to convey the information to people. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you think this is the best decision for us at this time? And if, if a leader can't effectively 
um, translate that to their people, then they're going to have a hard time. And then the second thing for me would be, uh, like I said, being okay with failure, just being okay with the fact that if we make a decision at noon and it turns out to be wrong, you have to assess what you did wrong. You know, why did you think that was the best idea? Where did that information come from? And then be okay with saying, okay, well, that wasn't what was best for us. So we're going to go ahead and, and go this way. But not being uh, sensitive to failure, I think that, you know, that's a dangerous place to be when you put an idea out there and someone doesn't like it or doesn't go well and you you take it personally and this becomes a sensitive sensitivity thing. A leader has to have thick skin. You have to be okay with people going, no, I don't like that. And your job, again, is to convey why it's the right decision. Definitely. Yeah, I think nowadays with, I don't know if you believe in like council culture and stuff, but in the public domain where everyone's on the internet and social media and then they get called out for previous mistakes and then there's so much sort of hostility, it seems, online to like, oh, you made this mistake, you haven't been able to change, you're still the same person. But actually, you know, leadership and running things you, you're bound to make mistakes aren't you so absolutely I think that you can't grow if you if you don't make those mistakes and again don't don't acknowledge them and um and attempt to learn from them I think that's the biggest thing you, you it's not it's one thing to just say okay I made a mistake but you have to really take the time to say to analyze it you know and sometimes that failure could be what what sent you on to the next best thing you've ever done absolutely <laughs> you know you never know Definitely. Yeah, I think it's great when you have workplaces which make you feel safe enough to make mistakes, even if you're not a leader, even if you're just working for someone, the space to make mistakes and then be able to correct them, I think is just something so valuable, which places, some places do, some workplaces do, but I've been in a lot of places where that's not the case. And then yeah, I think you definitely get more morale as as an employee if you're allowed to, you know, have the freedom to to learn from what you're doing. That's a that's a great point because I I tell my team that all the time that um again, it I I would not be an effective leader if I was oh so disappointed every time someone made a mistake, you know. Um, I think for me, the only thing that would bother me is for those that refuse to acknowledge the mistake. That's to me, that's the only issue I have. But I completely agree. You have to have a safe space in the with your employer, with your supervisor, with your team, you know, that if I propose something that I'm not going to get booed off the stage, you know, that, you know, if I if I if I lead something and it doesn't turn out to be fruitful, that it's okay. I'm not going to be fired over it. And and I have spoken to people who told me that's what their environment is like. And I can't imagine working in those conditions where you're not free to um, come up with different thoughts for fear that they're going to be shot down and you know possibly let go because of it. So it's 2021. Uh, not that you would know it, because since the pandemic, everything's just merged into one <laughs> one long old day. Um, but it is 2021, and there's still a lack of diversity to this day in terms of senior positions, um, both in academia and industry in science overall. But I think the engineering sector is um, especially affected. So is this something that you've personally experienced during your career? So not me directly, but I have listened to many stories of, you know, women telling me um, we just had a dynamic speaker, uh, Dr. Judith Puskis, and she is uh, at the Ohio State University. And again, she's got patents. She's a phenomenal woman. She's the first woman again to win our Goodyear medal. But just listening to her stories and how, um, you know, she was challenged because she spoke up too much. You know, literally she was telling the story of how uh, a supervisor went to her husband and told her husband that he really liked her, but she just spoke up too much. And I'm like, I can't imagine that, you know, she's in academia, that someone would go to your husband (laughs) in the 21st century to tell them that you speak too much. I just, that's mind boggling to me, but those, those people still exist, you know, where they want women to be seen, but not heard. Uh, There are so Mm -hmm. many disparities. If you look at the numbers of when the number of women that come in, as maybe equal with men, but if you look at the levels 
of women that end up at CEO. It's like, why is that so small? What is happening along that, that trail that they're being left behind? And it cannot be that they're not qualified. I refuse to accept that. It's that, that cannot mm-hmm. be it. And so I think that um, there's definitely still disparities because when people are looking around to make suggestions on promotions and um, uh, hiring, I think that it still becomes a, a club we go find people that we commune with, right? Um, if you are looking for someone and your boss says, hey, I'm looking for someone to lead this project, you're going to go to the person that you have a relationship with because that's what we naturally do as humans. Um, mm-hmm. We're not going to look around the room for that woman that might be a little quiet, but she gets her job done. You know, she's fantastic at what she does. So I definitely think there's still still, still disparities. Um, we can just see that by looking at the number of, of seniors and people in the C-suites and, and count the women. Why that is, I think that is um, that those implicit biases. I think that, again, when it comes to hiring, recruiting, if you are not looking, taking a hard look at your protocols and the questions that you're asking, even in the interviews, and how do those become disparaging for women, then I don't think it's going to change. So it has to be intentional. Definitely. And, I mean, New Zealand recently just passed um, a law where both women and men who are have experienced miscarriages they get paid um leave off to to grieve and come back and that seems like a really it seems both a sort of logical thing like why don't we have that in the first place because obviously it's a person who's gone through something and they need time both the person the woman carrying a child at but also you know it takes two people to to make a child and obviously the other person can be affected as well. Correct. So it Correct. seems like a logical thing, but something which, you know, in a lot of developed countries, maternity leave and paternity leave isn't enough. So what do you think the wider society could do to help retain women at these senior positions? I think... Um not making it a punishment. It's almost kind of, uh, and, I, and again, I, and I know that there are practices that make things illegal, but I still don't think that those uh, stop people from doing things. If you had a, a manager and they had to make the decision between hiring um, a woman in her childbearing years, because that's something that, you know, they used to think of, well, she's in her childbearing years, versus a man in his childbearing years, there's always that initial thought, hmm, I wonder if she's got kids and if she still wants them and, you know, am I going to have to worry about paying her and paying someone else? I think that that's, um, that it comes down to upper management. How does the, the, the people that run that company, what is the culture that they're creating? But why on earth does this country still not have mandatory paid leave? <laughs> it's mind boggling. Um, I think that there are, I know personally women that have graduated college and, They had to make the decision of either starting their family, taking some years off, or going directly into their industry and having to try to figure out how to to mitigate being, you know, a parent and um, a professional. And for myself, I mean, it was it was very tough, um, you know, having to to take positions where I worked third shift because childcare was so expensive, you know, so my my ex husband and I would have to alternate between, you know, well, you work days and, and those things, but Um, I think that companies have to be realistic that if you want the talent that you're going to have to understand that women and men need space to raise their family. It's equally important that our jobs are important to us. Our careers are important to us, but it cannot be the only thing that's important to us. And I think if management doesn't make that, uh, that culture known from the top down, we'll never get to that place where then they, it doesn't even have to be mandated by the government, you know, that it's just something that the the, the companies will do, that they value this young woman, they value this young man, and they're going to say, hey, if you're going to be your best self, because I give you 12 weeks off to go, you know, bond with your baby and come back, versus me making you come back in six weeks, and all you can think about is your baby, you know, what, you know, it's like, it's almost common sense, which one would be better for for the company and the production, it's going to be let, let those two people you know, take that time that's needed. And you look around other countries and I remember hearing stories of like women get, got a year off after a baby. They, they weren't concerned about whether or not they would lose their job when they got back. You know, they knew that that job was safe. So having that security and knowing that they can, they don't have to choose. 
You know, I can be a mom and a boss at, at the same time. You know, I might need to leave at two o'clock to go pick a kid up, but guess what? By four, I'll be back on, you know, and having that flexibility um, and, and not being rigid, I think is how we will be able to. And I think the next generation is going to demand it. I think that, you know, as, as the generations go on, we, we're doing what we're supposed to do, right? We're empowering the next generation to ask and demand more than the last generation got. And so uh, that ne- this next generation is not going to take it. They're, they're going to say, no, I'm going to get my PhD, and I'm also going to take my kid to soccer practice, and you're going to wait for me to get back. <laughs> you know, a company's going to say, okay, I don't, guess I don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, just hearing about... Um, what you're talking about with people having to choose and I remember when I was in academia and I was talking to um, some of the women who were postdocs and I was doing my PhD at the time and they were genuinely having the conversation of oh when I go into interviews I take off my wedding ring because then the people who are interviewing me won't think I'm of that age where I'm married and now I might want to have children and I was like what is that like what is that that's insane it that has no bearing on your actual talent or your abilities but it's something that I mean that was a few years ago I've I've since moved on and I feel a bit old looking back on it now but yeah like that that is something something very real um and I think I mean hopefully it is changing but um yeah I still think it's it's kind of prevalent and I think it's one of those slow things. Yeah, definitely. I think people are shining a light on it now. Um, but yeah, I think there's still still a way to go. And obviously there's quite a way to go to, you know, try and get women into senior positions and retain them as well. So what advice would you give to girls, women, um, but also minorities? Because there's quite a, a lack of diversity in science um, in general, um, and at those senior positions. So what advice would you give those people who are interested in working in the field of engineering or of rubber and plastics? So I, um, I think the very first thing I would say is be prepared to be the only woman in the room a lot of times. And I think that that's something that comes with um, growth with maturity as you walk into a room and, you know, you realize, okay, I'm the the only one here, you know, what does that actually mean? Um, And then finding a mentor, someone that can take you into those spaces and help you navigate those rooms. Um, And, and just giving you that, that uh, tacit knowledge that cannot be written down. You know, when you walk into the room and you're the only woman, this is what I recommend that you do. Um, so finding a great mentor, finding someone that can help you navigate and that's going to advocate for you and um, make sure that you are thick skinned a little. Um, and I don't say that because you'll be bullied. I say that because I'm having to deal with it right now where you have situations where I feel that people should have reached out directly to me for information that they need or suggestions or, or things like that. But they went to someone else. Let's just say that doesn't look like us. And, you know, and, and, and male. (laughs) And I'm like, why did you go to him? He's not, he doesn't have the answers for you, you know, but instead of asking the woman in the room, they go to the man that they're comfortable with. So I think that, um, especially for women, we have to learn that that's going to happen. Uh, sometimes that you're, you're, you have to speak a little louder, uh, and be okay with people not being okay with you speaking up. You know, if you have a passion for science, you have a passion for engineering, I think that let no one get in your way. Um, you know, when you close the door at the end of the day, you're the one that has that knowledge and information. And don't let anyone tell you that you're not worthy to sit at that table. Um, women, minorities, I don't care what, you know, what the situation is. Be prepared so that when it's your turn to speak up, you have something important to say. And don't let anyone diminish your voice. Absolutely. There's a lot of um, initiatives here in the UK that I know of that, you know, are trying to promote STEM to the younger generation, because obviously there's a drive to get young people in at a young age to get them into these sorts of careers. So what do you think we can do to promote 
STEM careers to younger people and not, you know, change the perception of science almost to something that is actually really interesting and kind of cool rather than something that's kind of dry and you just need to get through your science lesson at school? I think um, when it comes to, so like the type of learner that I was and still am, um, I am, and I think, I think this is very true for the science industry too, it has to be something physical that they can put their hands on. They have to be able to see how, why did I have to learn that lesson today in school? How does that actually translate to something physical that someone can touch? And, you know, how is it actually used? So for what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're developing, um, we have an experience Elastomer's Day where we have kids come in from high school and we want to try to implement this even at the middle school level and, you know, obviously change the scope of the, um, the, uh, what, what they do with the hands-on experiments, but getting their hands on stuff. I think it's one thing for someone to walk in a room and say, hey, I am a uh, mechanical engineer and this is what I do. It's totally different for that mechanical engineer to bring in a part of a car and say, I help design this. You know, this is the part that I help make smoother. Um, you know, I'm a in rubber applications and this is how I was able to keep this thing from burning up by putting this on it. You know, I think that's the kind of things that kids can take from A and get to Z and go, oh, wow. So if I learn, you know, the molecule structure, this is where it leads to. I think that you have to give them something that they can see at the end. So I think exposing them at a young, the younger age, as young as age as possible to something real and tangible they can touch and see and, and then that way their brain can help translate for them why that's interesting. Now, some kids may love the science lab part. You know, they just want to be in the lab with left alone. That's fine. But we have to expose them to as many different parts, uh, parts and opportunities and fields and careers at a young age as possible so we can see what piques their interest because everybody doesn't respond the same. I think that's one of the big challenges is just trying to adapt schooling, which is a massive challenge and and not the <laughs> not, not the conversation to have today. Um, so reflecting back on your life, on your career, what do you think has been both your greatest achievement and then your greatest challenge to date? So for me, it would definitely be uh, finishing college. So I, again, I was not a traditional, um, I was very traditional (laughs) in the very beginning, but I ended up getting married very young and starting a family uh, before I was 20. And so here I am, a wife at 19 and, you know, a mom and, uh, you know, trying to to finish my, my dream of college was something that was extremely important to me. I've always been an avid learner. Um, I've always been very, very um, much about education. I come from a family where uh, my siblings and I are the first, you know, college educated. You know, my grandmother uh, went to eighth grade. You know, my grandfather went to like third grade. And so for me, education was so important. So working my way through my 20s and early 30s, um, trying to finish college with a class here and a class there while raising three kids and working and being a soccer mom and, you know, running around the country with my kids. And that was my greatest challenge. But when I walked that stage, it was magical for me. Um, It was something that was very important for me, for me to be able to show my kids that uh, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what's put in front of you, get it done. And so that's kind of a model that I I say to them, even to this day, get her done. You know, (laughs) I don't care what's going on, get it done. (laughs) And so, (laughs) and so for me, I definitely would think finishing my bachelor's and then I'm scheduled to start um, on my executive MBA in uh, August at uh, Case Western University. I'm very excited about that. It's a very, very, very good school. And so I was accepted there. And so I'm going to continue my journey and, and uh, see where it leads. That's very exciting and very inspiring as well, because I've got a two-year-old nephew who is living with us at the moment, and he is a handful, and he's only my nephew. He's got a mom to take care of all the <laughs> all the other stuff, and I just get to play with him, and even that's yes. tiring. So that is <laughs> super inspiring. <laughs> yeah. So you're obviously very busy, and you do a lot of stuff. So what do you like to do outside of all of that? So probably my favorite would be 
gardening, which is really funny because I grew up um, in a very rural rural area and as a younger child and up until I was about 13. So we were always outside and doing things. And then when we moved into the city, that's something that kind of goes away. Uh, but during the pandemic, the one good thing that came out of it for me was that downtime because I was not able to travel and go anywhere. So I spent my entire time in my yard and, you know, planning different things that's going to bloom at different times of the year um, was very exciting for me. Uh, <laughs> I remember running home just to kind of see, OK, it should be 12 weeks today. Did that start blooming through? You know, like that kind of uh, nostalgia. Uh, for me, which was kind of funny because I hadn't I hadn't had that in a very long time. So that's the one good thing I am grateful for from the pandemic. And then I love to read. I absolutely love to read. Um, I am a huge John Grisham fan, and I'm actually rereading Harry Potter right now just because it's one of my favorites. Oh so. yes, <laughs> gotta love Harry Potter. <laughs> that is that is literally oh absolutely. I mean. Like me and my cousins quote the films and the books and we're just absolutely mad on Harry Potter. I was I was like when the first one came out, I was ten, just turning eleven. So I was one of those kids who was like waiting for my Hogwarts letter in the This is what my aunt made (laughs) me. Which never came. I don't know if you can see it. This is what my aunt made me. Oh wow, yeah. (laughs) It says Hogwarts. That's amazing. Yes. And I found myself quoting it in a, in a meeting one day. Someone said something good. I said, five points for Gryffindor. They were like, what? <laughs> I was like, never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> Disregard. Carry on. <laughs> you should just do that randomly in a movie, in a, in a meeting next time. Just give five points to someone, to Slytherin. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter bingo. Yes. <laughs> I do. I do find myself sort of... Because when me and my cousins quote stuff, we're like one person will do it and then another person will do it and it'll be like an echo thing. Yes. So whenever I hear like a quote, then I'll have the restraint not to say it in like the formal setting I'm in. But in my mind, it will just be all of us quoting yes. like whatever that sentence was. <laughs> oh, I totally understand. <laughs> yes. You're like, oh, this would so make sense right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I must tell them when I get out of this meeting. <laughs> So in your opinion, what are the most important things for effective communication? Um, I think, um, again, being able to listen and uh, not take yourself so seriously. Uh, I think that, you know, when it comes to leadership, people and I definitely I know that it's important to be seen in a um, in a in a specific way. You know, you want to be taken seriously. But at the same time. I think that a little humor sometimes can go a long way when you're when you are in a in a standoff with someone and and you're trying to get something through and and you're trying to communicate and you're not getting anywhere. Just a little bit of humor sometimes can can change, alter the way that someone takes that conversation. Um, But just being able to listen, fully listen and not do the mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm because you really don't like what they're saying, (laughs) but really trying to hear it from their their side. I do a, a game in my head where I do worst case scenario. That's always kind of a game I play in my head. So as they're telling me something, I immediately go to well, what's the worst case scenario of what they're telling me can happen. And then I work my way backwards from there. But everybody, I think you just have to find what works for you and just be be okay and be genuine. You know, don't, don't be different with every conversation because then people don't know how to communicate with you. So be authentic. Absolutely. That is great advice. Authenticity, I think, is something which maybe is lacking these days, but is hugely important. Yes. So that is it. Lakeisha, thank you so much for talking to me. I've really enjoyed it, actually. And I, I love your Harry Potter mask as well. I'm very <laughs> jealous. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, you might find one in the mail if you happen to drop me your address because I oh. happen to know someone that makes these. So if you just happen to drop me your address in an email, I'm sure one will show up at your house. I'm going to do thank it you right for now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this has been really fun. I really appreciate it. I, I love that you, uh, you know, the what you're doing here. And I think that um, uh, this has been great for me, too. I love conversations. So I appreciate it. And thank you. I do have one last question for you, though. Sure. What one thing do you like to leave our listeners with? Hmm. I will say I'll go with a with a with a Harry Potter scenario. Yes. I was so hoping you'd do that. (laughs) 
if I gave you the cloak of invisibility, would you use it for good or evil? Would you use it in situations where you could learn from others? Or would you spy on people to acquire knowledge that you weren't meant to have? So could I trust you with the cloak of invisibility? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I think for me, I'm a bit mischievous. So I do oh. like light pranks. But okay. I don't think I would be evil with it. I think I would okay. just like maybe like scare someone. Like if they walk into a room, you're like, Bleh! but I think generally <laughs> overall, I would use it for good. I like to think so anyway. <laughs> See, that's a lot of power to have though, right? If someone really gave you that cloak, you know, would you be able to handle it? And so, and, and it kind of goes back to the, do you do what, are you the same person in front of and behind the camera? So it's kind of the same thing, you know? But if, if I gave you that cloak and people couldn't see you, would you be you as well or would you become someone else? I had so much fun talking to Lakeisha. It's always great to find a fellow Harry Potter nerd. Lakeisha is a testament to the fact that there's no set paths in life. How gaining experiences in different fields and making a good impression can take you to places you don't expect. Making mistakes and learning from them is the cornerstone to both a productive workplace and good leadership, and it's something that all industries, including life science, can take a look at. Obviously, we want to mitigate the risks in process-driven activities like manufacturing therapies or processing samples, but empowering employees to take responsibility for their mistakes at all levels can result in a more efficient and happier workforce. Taking more risks in spaces like marketing can also help companies explore the best ways to reach their audience, to drive sales, or make an impact in the space. Lakeisha's top tips for effective communication were listening, being authentic, and not taking yourself too seriously. Authenticity is crucial in building trust in a relationship. If you want someone to take on board what you're saying when it goes against what they think, they're going to need to trust you. Humour is also a great tool in the communication arsenal to lighten situations or make something stand out. Ask anyone who knows me and they'll probably tell you how witty and hilarious I am. Definitely not someone who makes bad jokes and loves puns. If you liked this conversation, let me know. You can find more information about this episode by heading to the Malby website. Use the hashtag pros and comms on social media to carry on the conversation and make sure you follow Pros and Coms on your favourite podcast platform to keep up to date with new episodes.